Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this we webinar on effective remote working and delivery in collaboration with Microsoft. I am Beverly Clark, and I'm the CAS National Community Manager, and I will be your host for this session. We have six panelists joining us today. We have Neil Rickers from Computing at School, Jennifer King from Microsoft, James Robinson from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, along with Donna Shaw, Paul Watkins and Sarah Clark, who are Microsoft and Education Fellows. In this webinar, you will learn about well-being when working from home, pedagogy around remote delivery, 21st century learning and emergency remote learning, along with demonstrations of Microsoft technology such as Flipgrid, Teams and PowerPoint. Please use the questions window, which is on the right hand side, for asking any questions during the webinar. Myself and Neil Rickers will be moderating the question window and answering questions as we go through the webinar. Between each panelist speaking, we're also going to take questions. So keep popping questions into the window, please. I'll also ask if you can just pop into the question window your name and where you're from. So we, we, we can know who you find out who you are. Okay. So if you start popping questions in, let's see where you're from. Okay, so waiting for those to start coming through. Okay, so we've started off with someone from West Sussex, London, Cheshire, Berkshire, so right across the country, lots of different people. Thank you so much for doing that. So we'll start our webinar by speaking to Neil Rickus. Neil is a senior lecturer in computing education at the University of Hertfordshire and an independent consultant. One of those independent consultancy jobs is working for computing at school. Okay, so Neil, lots of us have many different digital devices which are constantly beeping, vibrating and distracting us. It is estimated approximately around 20, it takes us 25 minutes to refocus once we've been distracted by a device. Um, so, do you have any advice for managing all of these notifications and messages that keep pinging into us? Okay, thanks for your introduction, Beverly. Yeah, so the first one I'd like to mention, and I'm hoping that you can still see me rather than uh, my entire screen, and um, is is regarding the do not disturb function and what this allows you to do you probably used it at night before and rather than just having it on at night time if you can pop it on perhaps when you're in a call such as this if you know you need to focus for a certain amount of time what that will allow you to do is to ensure your phone isn't beeping away all your calls will go to voicemail for example how to do that i've created a document uh, to share and i'll share the url with you in the chat afterwards but that's got all the links to the various resources that i mentioned during this it might also be that you want the notifications to only come from certain apps for example so for example whatsapp or uh, the nhs tracing app when it becomes available but not uh, notifications from some random online game for example uh, that you uh, got a few years ago the other thing that you may want to do is to think about the digital well-being of others as well when you are showing those not notifications and one way to do that is by perhaps delaying when messages are sent so uh, both gmail and outlook allow you to only send emails at certain times of the day or have them uh, delayed for a, a certain period so they don't arrive in people's inboxes in the middle of the night okay thank you so much neil i hopefully you can all hear me a few nods there okay excellent okay so that's all very well but what if i want to completely switch off and just disconnect from the digital world what what would what should i do well there's a number of apps out there there's one called hold for example and i've just started it on my uh, device here and it means that for that 20 minute period if i can ensure that i don't touch my 
device for that time I'm rewarded with some virtual currency and that can then be used for things in the real world everything from a trial of a health product to discounts on popcorn at view cinemas for example it might also be that perhaps we want to limit access to a device google have recently come up with uh, this lovely paper phone and depending on which phone you have there's an app that can either print out your reminders and your notification sorry notifications uh, your events for the day you then pop your phone in there seal it up and you can still use it for uh, an emergency if need be but your device is then hidden away from you uh, so you can't get to it the other thing you might want to consider is the occasional digital detox we did one with a five-year-old over the weekend and that was a real eye-opener for her um, but we do obviously have the good old off button if the worst comes to the worst although do bear in mind that that then means that perhaps a, an elderly relative or someone who might want to get in touch with you in an emergency actually won't be able to okay thank you so much so we're also reading lots at the moment about the impact of social media, particularly misinformation and its impact all around mental health. Um, how does this link to what you've been discussing? Yeah, so with those, <clears throat> excuse me, with those notifications again, it might be that we only want certain notifications to appear from different apps. So perhaps we just to inform the direct messages on Twitter or Facebook for example but we don't need to be informed of every like or well when someone comments on a post for example now social media at the minute it's more and more important that we are sharing things with our family and friends but often we do have this perfect life portrayed on social media and uh, might be encouraged to learn new things and there'll be a, a pressure around that so it is worth remembering that we've all got different pressures at the minute whether it be family commitments homeschooling people with different illnesses changes in work etc etc the other thing that I, I know i'm certainly uh, working on at the minute is when i use social media for work purposes and actually if i am commenting on something related to computing education for example in the evening that is still work of a sort so if we can try and separate those two things then that certainly helps as well excellent thank you so much so so far you focused on digital devices what about the physical environment in which we work yeah a lot of us have been uh, taught to work at home and be given the laptop and the charger and have spent all our time hunched over the desk and sort of six seven weeks in are uh, starting to feel it so if we can replicate the proper office physical environment as much as possible decent chair external mouse keyboard and a monitor perhaps that will certainly help uh, it might be that perhaps work can lend you an external monitor or there's an old tv i looked on uh, ebay this morning i could have certainly picked up a decent sized external monitor for 10 20 pounds if need be it's also great if we can separate our work and our home lives as much as possible even if our desk is in a corner of a, a spare bedroom like this one uh, packing the stuff away at the end of the day closing the door if we can will help keep those those barriers separate as well as trying to avoid distractions from the crazy three and five year old who are running around downstairs at the moment okay thank you so much neil so you've mentioned removing uh, removing yourself from the work environment is vital is there anything else that we can do to get us through the current work situations and some sort of daily exercise perhaps yeah that daily exercise we've certainly been encouraged to do and there's lots of apps out there now that will mean we can sort of uh, try and make some gains uh, from our exercise or make it a bit more enjoyable. Now Strava is an app that you may be aware of already, already that allows us to share our daily exercise, it allows us to compare it to other people, track our progress over time and there's also one uh, called Sweatcoin and I'll just show you that up to the camera and that tracks my steps every day and it also rewards me with virtual currency and as with the hold app that can be used in uh, the in the real world for different 
products. Uh, for example, I'm currently saving up to get some new headphones, so this is uh, why I can finally go. And uh, the other one is uh, geocaching, which is a, uh, a real-world treasure hunt, and you can check your uh, progress online, and there's a very active community there where you can uh, log what you found. Okay, thank you so much, Neil. As I said, mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, please keep popping them into the question window and we'll answer them as we go along. So we're going to start moving over to one of our other presenters, Jennifer King. Jennifer joins us from Microsoft. She is an award-winning international thought leader in education with 20 years of experience in the education sector from classrooms to corporations. She is passionate about the success of students and their teachers and how the power of technology can transform the way that they work and learn. So we're going to swap across to Jennifer now. Um, it's, uh, thank you, Beverly, for inviting uh, myself and the Microsoft Innovative Educators Fellows onto this call. Uh, we're very happy to be here today. I am the uh, Schools Engagement Lead for the UK, and for all of you that are on the call and watching on demand, I would love for you to get in touch. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Jen King, uh, uh, double underscore, uh, follow Microsoft EDUK, and also uh, get in touch on LinkedIn as well. So I'm just talking a little bit about what school is like today. So um, thinking about what it was like six, seven weeks ago when we were going to school, where um, students were able to go to a brick and mortar school, uh, they were able to have great learning in the classroom, they knew they were safe there, uh, they knew that they had their friends, the community, and same with the, with the staff as well. And it was also a very accessible and inclusive space. And now students are going to schools, they continue to go, um, but they're now going in the cloud or they're having some other kind of remote learning situation. And the real question out there is whether or not students are able to continue to have a good um, learning experience, whether they're safe, whether they're able to get that sense of community and connection, and whether or not the content is accessible and inclusive. But we have to keep in mind when we think about what, um, what learning today looks like, that it's not a direct translation. So for educators out there who are trying their best to recreate their classrooms and recreate their unit plans and their lessons that they've been doing, it's just not going to work because it's a very different situation working remotely. So it's now time to rethink the paradigm. We want to make sure that we are um, thinking about um, different ways of doing things. When we were in school, we had a teacher-led experience. Uh, whether we were a great teacher who um, had, had uh, lots of facilitation in the classroom and you weren't at the front, it was still very much teacher-led, it was directed, um, there was a lot of uh, social interactions physically, you could read body language, which we all know is a teacher's superpower, um, and we had a real high level of control with our students. But now with our students away from us, where we're not in the same space, we have to have students who are self-motivated, where the learning truly is a facilitated experience for them. That we have to embrace finding that social connection via technology, really coming into, those, into the world of digital natives where they do feel that social connection through emojis and GIFs and memes. And we have a very low level of control. We can't give them the teacher look. You know, we can't make them uh, do things or separate them. Uh, there's a very low level of control. So in response to that, we have to have a real high level of personalization. It's such a great opportunity to think about each of our students individually and what they need. And really thinking about what does the modern learner need? They need to feel safe. They need to be able to talk to their teacher. They need to be able to see their classmates, see their teacher, get feedback. And they really need to learn how to learn. If they're going to have that motivation, we need to be creating experiences for them that they want to engage in. 
But, uh, but the good news is that a lot of the pedagogical practices that we used before are the same ones that work now, which is wonderful. Um, so if any of you have been doing flipped learning or teach back um, or, or teaching your students how they learn, then you're in good stead already. Um, the Open University just uh, re uh, released their report on teaching practices for 2020, and they had a side report about the best teaching practices to use for remote learning. And so that's what this list is here. Um, and I encourage you to go look up that report, um, look through those pedagogical practices. It'll give you great ideas of things you can do to make sure that you are getting your students um, that facilitated experience that they need to become motivated learners. And then thinking about the 21st century learning design um, framework about remote learning. When we think, oh, is this a good app to share with my kids? Is this a good um, activity to create? I recommend using the four C's of remote learning to figure that information out. So asking yourselves, are my students able to cre um, create something and work with other people? Are they able to participate in group work? Can they talk to each other on one-to-one, one-to-few, one-to-many? Are they creating something that's never existed in the world? These three um, pillars of collaboration, communication, creativity are going to create what is so important for 21st century skills. But above all, at this point in time, we need to make sure that we have compassion for our students and we have compassion for ourselves and compassion for parents, making sure that we're thinking about the well-being of all of our learners and their family. Anyone's psychological well-being comes before any kind of learning can happen. We all know that as educators, but that's the same for all of the members of the student's family. A lot of your classes have doubled or tripled or quadrupled even because now you have parents as your students and you have to be thinking about everyone's well-being as you're setting work. So with that, Beverly, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll just take control of the screen. Thank you. So I was quite interested in the flipped learning experiences that you you, you mentioned flipped learning. Um, if attendees can pop into the window, if you've used flipped learning, please pop that into the window so we can have a show of hands almost as to how many people have used flipped learning um, during the lockdown and how it's been working. You see, I've used flipped learning using videos and OneNote. Mixed results is another bit of feedback that's coming through. Um, so it's mixed results. Some students really engage with it, but some don't. So Jen, have you got anything you can add there around flipped learning and why some students and do and don't and what we can do on that to encourage them? Well, we all know that students um, are different, just like all humans are different and flipped work learning works for some and flipped learning, learning doesn't work for others. That's why it's a great list of, of 20 different pedagogical practices. So if that one's not working, that's okay. Try something else um, and, and definitely use this time to understand what your students need to be doing. Um, if flipped learning is, is something that you, that you really wanna try, then a, a, a great secondary activity is the teach back activity so that a student um, uh, has to con um, consume some information they need to get some of that um, early knowledge acquisition but then they need to present it back to the class so putting that accountability back on them will mean that they're not just turning in a report but rather they will be accountable to their um, peers for learning that subject okay thank you very much jen we're now going to move, move across to James Robinson. James Robinson is an experienced computing educator and advisor with a background in computer science for almost 10 years and extensive classroom experience, including a range of STEM subjects. So James works with um, the Raspberry Pi Foundation and is a part, which is a part of the National Center for Computing Education. So I'll hand over to James, who's going to speak to us about emergency remote teaching, a situation which has come upon us. So over to you, James. Thank you very much, Beverly. Um, I'm going to show my screen. Um, I have got I've got a single slide with a few links on that. Um, hopefully might appear shortly but if not it's in the it's attached in the um, webinar 
uh, itself. So um, before I, I delve into emergency remote teaching, I thought I'd just um, pick up briefly on, on um, what Jen was talking about with, with flipped learning. And I think another um, sort of uh, complementary approach to flipped learning is something called uh, peer instruction, which is very much like the teach back, but rather than the, the student presenting back to, the, to their peers, um, we, we use questioning and discussion to uh, expose misconceptions and it just so happens we're talking about peer instruction at tonight's uh, CAS chat so if you want to find out more come and join us there. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about emergency remote teaching which is this kind of um, situation we find ourselves in at the moment where students are not able to work in school and teachers are having to set work remotely um, and it's not a situation which we planned for, which has had lots of thought and, uh, and energy going into being ready for it. It's just been foisted upon us with very, very little notice. And I think the first thing to kind of to highlight is that this is not normal remote teaching. This is an emergency sort of situation. And so the provision that we offer, we, we're probably not going to see the same benefits and all of the same challenges that we would if we were going into this with weeks and weeks and weeks of planning. Um, so we've actually just recently produced a quick read and there's a link to the um, to this document. It's a two page document, but my printer didn't print the black back. Um, it's a two page document which you can download from the National Centre uh, for Computing Education. and It talks a lot more about this emergency remote teaching. So one of the things that I think educators should reflect on in this time are the kinds of opportunities that they can provide to their learners um, and we can look at that fairly simply as things such as asynchronous and synchronous um, terms which have been thrown around quite a lot recently and I think many many schools are at, as a minimum kind of providing asynchronous experiences for their learners they're pushing content out to their learners asking them to engage in it and then uh, perhaps feeding back to those learners afterwards. But some schools are also embarking upon synchronous learning. So like we're having here, live and interactive conversations. Um, and they may be using those for teaching and learning purposes, or they may purely be pastoral. I know my, my daughter's school, for example, use those experiences for kind of regular check-ins to see how the students are. Um, so I think that's really, really important. And I think the experiences that we're offering also um, kind of align with the, the goals of what it is we're trying to provide in this sort of slightly odd situation. You know, is the goal of education right now to be uh, providing uh, progression and challenging opportunities and differentiation? Or is it more about making sure that our students' well-being is addressed and they feel happy and safe and able to learn? And though that focus and goal will sort of direct the kinds of activities that we provide for our learners. Um, in the quick read that I um, that I showed a moment ago, um, we also reference a similar kind of framework to the 21st century um, learning skills that Jen shared. Um, it's a framework developed by some researchers led by um, uh, Means, and their, their framework kind of is a way, a tool for comparing different types of online learning activities uh, and really sort of describing those and in order to kind of draw comparisons between them and look for gaps in, in terms of the provision that we're offering. Um, and so I think that's something that I think educators could be doing at, at this point in time. Um, and I think also we should be thinking about the kind of range of experiences that are available to our learners, not just that we are providing as teachers, but also from lots of other organisations. So, you know, we all know that there's lots of kind of broadcast style things out there, uh, web uh, webinar type things from, from celebrities, um, there's apps you can join in with, all kinds of content that's, that's sort of surfacing. And then you've got very formal things like the um, National Centre for Computing Education have just started rolling out a um, home teaching programme, which is where we're providing students with content and there's regular check-ins with teachers uh, from the National Centre to support them. So there's loads of different provision out there. Um, but each has a sort of slightly different pedagogical focus. Um, so I'm more very much about kind of pushing content out to you and you absorbing it, learning it, doing something with it. But those opportunities don't really engage the creative, collaborative sort of aspects of learning that we perhaps see in our normal classroom. So there's a sort of question for educators, how can we use the resources that are available out there already and enhance those, build upon those to bring collaboration and creativity to our students um, in the virtual space that we're engaging them with. 
Um, and the other thing that sort of stems from that is that I think at this time, and we, we we kind of address this a little bit when Jen was talking about some students will engage with things like peer instruction, sorry, with them um, flip learning, um, but others won't. Some will be able to access all of the content we put online, others won't. Um, I think this period is going to really highlight some, some uh, areas of inequality in terms of the provision that students have. And that's another thing for educators to think about is how are all of their learners accessing this content? Do all learners have equal access where technology is the sort of the mediator, um, you know, is mediating that learning? Do all students have equal access? Um, and the final thing I want to mention about the quick read is that we also talk a little bit in there about some of the barriers. And there are some of the really obvious barriers, and I've kind of hinted at one there about, um, about access to technology. But things like, um, you know, Jen mentioned our class size is growing because now we're working with many, many parents. You know, how many parents out there don't have the capacity to support their learners with the technolog technological side of things particularly? And so I think there's lots and lots of uh, barriers that we should be thinking about and how we can be addressing those both in this time of emergency remote teaching, but also going forward as we come out of this. Um, and so the, again, there's a, there's a framework that's provided in there, um, and I, I forget the name, but it's in the quick read, which highlights some different categories of, of barriers that we can start to think about how we might overcome those. And the final point that I want to talk about really quickly is that Although we're in this very weird time at the moment, it is going to end. There will be a return to something that we regard as normal education. And I think what's really uh, sort of important for, for educators going through this period is to reflect on what we can learn from this period. What are the pedagogies that we've uh, we are applying and using in this emergency remote teaching situation? Can we apply those to our, our new normal when we return? And you know, lots of us have been thrust into learning new tools and new uh, technologies. How can we use those to enhance our regular teaching if we weren't before already? And I'd like to flag one opportunity which is coming up from the National Centre, which is uh, a, a new course that's coming out in June, which is to help educators investigate questions like this through a series of action research projects. Uh, and we'll be working with educators to help devise their own intervention. And so teachers might want to look at how they can bring some of this remote uh, emergency remote teaching practice and apply it to the normal situation when we return. And all the links to lots of the things that I've mentioned are in the PDF, which is attached to the webinar session. Um, that's all I wanted to talk about, Beverly. So uh, thank you very much for letting me join you today and talk about that. Very happy to take any questions. Otherwise, I'll just uh, shut up now. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, James. So we've got a couple of comments in the question window. So is someone agreeing with you that this situation is definitely widening the gap? So I don't know if you want mm -hmm. to add anything else around that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, we, we are yet to see the sort of the knock on effect of all of this. I mean, you know, we're, we're sort of seven weeks in, I think, something like that. Um, I mean, anecdotally, one of the things that we that I've seen in talking to educators, and, and again, I must stress this is you know, completely anecdotally, is this sort of trend a little bit that uh, where um, a lot of educators and in independent schools are being asked to deliver synchronous lessons. They're very much maintaining their timetable. And so this this sort of sector of society are getting that experience. Whereas in the state schools where there hasn't been quite a, uh, a kind of um, a consistent kind of expectation from all those different schools and guidance from the schools uh, from the, the government on, on what they should be doing. There's a real variation in terms of what schools are delivering. And that's to be expected. Um, but I think that's that's a really interesting gap that I've kind of noticed. Um, and I think, as I've uh, alluded to, I think the technology is going to be a really interesting challenge. Um, you know, lots of schools have, are providing kit to their learners to help them access some of the, the, the resources they're setting. But I think, um, you know, there, there are more things that we need to think about as we come back to a new normal. And that's going to be just it's going to be something that every educator is going to have to have in their back of their mind and think about how they might address with their context and their their specific learners. OK, thank you very much. I've got one other question, which is, I'd say is for all of our panelists. What best practice can I do to promote pair, pair work or group work using Microsoft Teams? So, Jen or Sarah? 
sorry, just coming off mute. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how best to promote group work in Microsoft Teams? Yes. Well, the, the first um, element is, is creating a channel um, for your group. So you'll want to, um, you know, split your group, your class up into, you know, fours or fives or whatever the size group is. And then you can create individual channels for them um, where they will be able to conduct that work. You'll want to um, set really strong expectations, you know, follow all the same best practice group work that you would in the class where you have roles set, um, what the outcome are ensuring that each person knows what they're uh, what they're supposed to deliver um, but then share with them all of the um, uh, options that they have to be able to collaborate using uh, chat using um, video um, meetings that sort of thing being able to collaborate on a word document or a PowerPoint um, so, so share with them all of all of those um, options out there uh, using Teams, but across all of uh, Office 365, all the products you can collaborate on together. Just to add into that, if the, if you have access, you can with the private channels, you can set up private channels with, <clears throat> excuse me, specific pupils in that channel, and they can work away on a task, and you can put the files that they're going to be working on in that private channel, and that then becomes the group that they would normally be working in in a physical school so um that, that's one of the options that you can do it okay thank you we'll develop upon that a bit later when sarah does the microsoft team section i will now introduce one of our microsoft innovative educator fellows donna shah so donna is a mom a nana and an edtech educator based in London. Since the beginning of 2020, she's worked as an assistant digital learning advisor at Cognito Schools, supporting with digital learning for staff and pupils. So I'm going to hand over the screen to Donna and we'll hear from Donna around Microsoft PowerPoint and how it can be used effectively. Okay, so I am going to talk to you about PowerPoint and I'm going to talk you through some of the things that you can do with PowerPoint that maybe you weren't aware of. Uh, but as you can see there, there's my Twitter handle. Uh, feel free to connect with me on Twitter and I should have put my LinkedIn on there. But I'm going to talk about how my teachers are using this in their schools. And as we've already heard, we've been using the asynchronous learning method. And there's a few ways that you can use PowerPoint to support asynchronous learning with your students. One of them is to record a slideshow. And then the second one is to use a screen recording. Now you may think they're one and the same, but they are two completely different methods uh, of getting information to your students, of sharing those, those details asynchronously. And I'm gonna talk you through both of them separately. Some of the options that are available that our, our teachers are using to share with students are they're, they're saving their PowerPoint presentation as a show. They're exporting them to videos, but they're also publishing to Stream, which is another one of the Microsoft tools and makes it really easy to create safe and secure channels, video channels, if you will, uh, to share with students within the company. It also means that they've got the facility to share across with other schools as well to, to support workload. But the first things first is they will see up at the top there is uh, an adding. We're going to add that tab. So I'm going to talk you through a little video. So I made this video using PowerPoint, but it is silent. So you can see I haven't got the recording tab. So I'm gonna to go to the file. I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the options because I'm gonna add this tab and I only need to do it once. I'm actually customizing my ribbon and I'm gonna scroll down all the way to the bottom until I can find the recording box. I'm gonna check the box and that will then give me the recording tab and the recording options. Now, as I say, once you've done this once, you won't have to do that again. That stays with you for the rest of your presentations. But how do we go about recording a slideshow and why would we use the slideshow recording option? Well, there's a couple of things that you can do on this. You've got options, you can see myself down in the corner, but you can go right down and you can toggle your audio and your video off. So you can choose if you want to share that picture of yourself. Yes, it's great for your students to do that, but you don't know where the circumstances of all your teachers, where they're working and where they're delivering their lessons from. 
You've got the option to annotate with the pen. So you've got a range of colors and it will actually record you as you're making the markings with your pen. But the narration also sits with each slide. So as you move through the slides, it will take and record that narration into that slide. So I'm gonna talk you through now how we go about doing that. So this should be my record slideshow. I've got my options to toggle on and off. You can see I've turned my camera off on this one. I'm gonna start recording and it will count me in. And it's now recording everything that you do with your cursor, with your pen, with your tools. You can annotate, you can use the pen and you can add on sections. So you can see there, I'm just gonna add on in a moment, my nice little question mark. And it's recording all of these and each and every single one of them sits inside your slide. So your students can have access to the lesson just as they would do if you were presenting in the classroom. It's not exactly the same, but it's the best of what we can do at the moment. There's the notes section. So if you want to read those whilst you're doing your presentation and you go all the way through. But then we've also got then the screen recording option. Now screen recording is actually where you can choose what area of your screen you want to, to share with your students. You can choose if it's just a window, you can choose to share everything. And the beauty of using this is that you can actually have a combination of different tools and programs. So it might be that you use Microsoft Whiteboard in your classroom, your students are familiar with this, and it means that you can carry on and continue those familiar methods, sharing programs, sharing desktops, using the digital linking, but you also have the access, uh, the ease of access to save as a video. So this next video will take you through step by step on how we go about doing our screen recording. So you can see from the top, we've got the recording tab, and I'm gonna to toggle onto there and my screen recording. You can turn the audio on or off. Now I turned mine off because I was going to talk through it to you. So it also means you can use this in a synchronous lesson if you're unsure about your own Wi-Fi. Counting me in. So now I know that I'm recording. So I would talk, I can scroll through, I can toggle through. I'm going through my presentation. I'm asking the students to pause because there was a pause button. Then I'm jumping over to my whiteboard because I'm taking responses from them. And I can add those onto my screen in my lesson or afterwards. So it's taken down, it's recording step by step, each and every aspect that I'm using. I could choose to toggle to different programs. I may go to YouTube to share a video. A few minutes later, I've got to the end of my presentation. So I went back and toggled back to my slideshow. I brought my cursor to the end to stop the recording. The recording will then populate onto your slideshow and you've got several different ways that you can then save this. I tend to right click and save my media as, which means I can save my video into the appropriate space, which is generally into my OneDrive. You can also save it as a show. You can export to a video. And as I can say, you can publish direct to stream all within your PowerPoint. Such a powerful tool. The next steps of what you might want to do with your video, you can upload it to Teams, so you can drop it inside the class materials, and I'm sure Sarah might touch on those later. You can share it via stream, and with that, you can actually pop into your, your team a direct link to the video. You might actually add a tab in Teams, or you might actually put your video into part of a streams channel. And I know that a lot of our schools are using this feature to create assemblies so that parents and their children and their families can actually watch an assembly and visit it at a time that's appropriate to them. Just remembering if you do host it into your OneDrive that you need to check the view only link when you're sharing that. That is me and the power of PowerPoint. I am going to now stop showing my screen and hopefully pass it back. Thank you very much, Donna. We'll take questions for, uh, around the Microsoft technologies at the end. I'm going to now move us across to hear from Paul Watkins. Uh, Paul is going to talk about Flipgrid for us. So Paul is an IT and computing teacher across in Wales, I believe, uh, at the Microsoft Showcase School. Uh, he is a Microsoft Innovative Educator Fellow 
a master trainer, a Skype master teacher, and a Flipgrid student voice executive member. You can perhaps tell us a bit more about all of those different items, Paul. Um, and you've recently been acknowledged in a 2020 EdTech 50. Very well done. And Paul is a member of the Welsh Government's National Digital Learning Centre. So I'll swap the screen across to Paul. Okay, thank you. I'm just waiting. Uh, there we go. May I flip it on it? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's good because there's multiple screens here. I just wanted to make sure. So I'm going to be going back and forth between these two. But first of all, can I say thank you ever so much for the invite to uh, join with you and actually share a tool that at this time um, is the perfect tool that all teachers really should be looking at for connecting and engaging uh, with their pupils. It is the perfect tool for, um, for driving uh, teaching and learning, but more importantly, it's also the perfect tool for that important uh, well-being of the children uh, that we still care for and miss uh, while we're apart from them. Flipgrid was originally designed by uh, Dr. Charlie Miller and colleagues uh, in the University of Minnesota, and it was for him to keep in touch with his PhD students. And now we are seeing it as a tool that during this time of uh, closure across countries of schools, there are literally thousands of teachers signing up every week to use this tool to continue engagement with their pupils. And while the doors are closed to our schools, we have to realise that um, social distancing for many of our children mean isolation. They rely heavily upon their peers uh, their friends in school for that support structure daily and now they are finding themselves uh, without it but thanks to Flipgrid we have this wonderful tool that's able to continue those important connections with their colleagues and with their friends. Now you may be wondering what uh, Flipgrid is. Flipgrid is quite simply a social video engagement platform accessed through a web browser or through an app. Pupils are able to record videos um, that are posed, uh, uh, that are in response to a question that their teacher will ask them through secure grids, which are essentially a, a website. Um, teachers are able to post topics of conversation, uh, topics of debate, and pupils can uh, engage with their teachers, but also respond to each other in this uh, safe and secure uh, environment. And the great thing is, pupils can be really creative in the way in which they uh, they post their uh, suggestions and their answers. They can um, drop stickers on, they can do screen recordings, they can even, if they're not feeling confident enough just to talk, there's even a sticky notes option so that they can script what they want to say. And there's also the editing tools uh, within it. So many of our children are used to using these social media tools, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, things like that. So this platform just lends itself perfectly uh, to them. Now, you may be thinking, oh, this is a new tool, a new app, I'm going to, have to start creating everything from scratch. But the great thing is, so many of the resources that you use every day with your pupils, you can use them in, in Flipgrid as well, in providing those as part of the task that you were giving to the pupils. And there is a wonderful, wonderful community out there of student voice ambassadors who are providing free resources that are available to all teachers through the Disco Library, which is, uh, can be found at flipgrid.com, where teachers can download lessons and resources, filtering them on subjects and on the age of the pupils. And you can see as well there, we can link it into Teams, uh, which brings everything kind of under one roof for our pupils. Uh, and the great thing is, it's not just the pupils who get to be creative, but it's the teachers as well. Uh, Sarah's, uh, Donna's just shared about uh, doing screen recorders and screen captures uh, that you can share with the pupils. Flipgrid has something called the short camera, where a teacher is able to record up to 10 minutes of doing a demonstration um, and using all the wonderful tools and features that are there once again within uh, Flipgrid. Some teachers are showing uh, really kind of uh, ingenious uses of it and innovative uses of it at, at this time in providing instruction videos and demo videos. And what I love is there's teachers who are using it to read stories to their children, that the parents can guess, just go on to the grid, the children know to log in with their accounts, and they can hear their teacher reading a story to them every day, just like they may be used to in school, giving them that degree of normality. And the great thing is teachers are innovative. 
when you give them a tool they see it as a ball of clay and they'll take it and they'll shape it and they'll mold it to exactly what it is they want it to be and here we have a document that is just growing and growing and growing that Flipgrid have put together showing the uses that they have had shared with them from teachers from across the world and you can see it's not just in a classroom but actually in a school and engaging with the wider community as well. Uh, jo Ney, who's part of the Flipgrid engagement team, has got a say, and she says, if you can think it, you can Flipgrid it. And here's the evidence that teachers are actually seeing that and taking that on board and doing it uh, every single day. Now, let me give you some examples of where Flipgrid could be used. If you're a maths teacher who's uh, sending out some work to your pupils right now, uh, the work that you're having returning is just going to have answers on it. But sometimes you need to sit with that people to understand kind of how they got to that answer. So Flipgrid provides us with a platform where the child can actually talk through how they got to that answer. And not only are they going to be uh, talking about it, but thanks to the whiteboard that's built in, into it, they can actually digitally ink uh, their solution on there. And that also helps with the shy people, so those who may not want to show their face. They can switch it to a whiteboard. You don't see them, but you hear them because ultimately their voice is the most important thing. Not whether they're looking good, but when you hear their voice, you know kind of what's going on in their mind. And teachers can send out daily puzzles and uh, challenges for the pupils to do through Flipgrid and get it sent back to them and hear the children talking about how they came to uh, their solutions. We've also got reading, which is so, so important. And teachers will often sit with the pupils and hear them reading and hear how they've developed. Well, teachers are able to set it up so that pupils can actually go to a quiet place and sit and read, and their teacher's able to hear that child reading for up to 10 minutes and actually give them feedback and praise. Because even when they're at home, it's so important to continue giving our pupils praise for the amazing work that they are doing in a time that they are finding difficult uh, for themselves. And also, teachers can be so creative in engaging the children in activities and distracting them from the things that are going on around them, but in ways which are also using some really, really important skills that will uh, line them up for the future. So why not give the pupils a challenge? Tell them, I want you to go into your cupboard and I want you to find an object. It could be a, a tin, a, a food tin, or it could be something from under the sink. And I want you to produce a TV advert that's promoting that object and get your family involved in it as well when you write a script and there's learning going on as a family unit but you're looking at all those skills that are being used in actually uh, producing that you can have doodle challenges using the whiteboard why not have your child to record a diary during this time so it's something that they can look back on uh, later show and tell there's so many i've seen wonderful examples of uh, people people showing their pets off they don't get to bring them into school normally but now they can show their pets to their friends uh, and a flip hunt where you can set up a challenge where pupils will go through and have to complete the number of tasks um, that the teacher sets to them there was a wonderful example of creativity with a teacher out in the states a couple of weeks ago who actually did the masked singer with all the teachers with masks on and the pupils had to vote off the teachers uh, going forward and it was real fun for the kids to want to be able to engage with their teachers uh, that way and a very, very uh, kind of powerful use of it was with the University of Newcastle, where they had their first virtual graduation service with the doctors who were graduating and going straight out onto the front line. And of course, part of their ceremony of graduation is they have to give their oath. Well, they couldn't have that ceremony and they used Flipgrid. And you can actually go on there and you can see these teachers giving their oath. And it's a very, I'm actually getting goosebumps just talking about it. Um, it's a very, very emotional um, uh, thing to see. You can support parents, new parents who are there as well, give them their help, make help videos for them in this difficult time, but it's all about connecting friends. Brilliant example, get the class to sing happy birthday, get the kids singing happy birthday to their friends, uh, especially for those who are in lockdown. My own daughter had this, she had uh, friends of ours and teachers I know from across the world singing happy birthday to her on her birthday. And she sat there with a smile from year to year as she heard wishes from Australia, from Russia, from America, from Argentina. They were coming from everywhere and it made her day so, so special. I'll just There's jump in there, Paul. In. Sorry. So I'll just jump, come in there. You've come to the, coming up to the end of your slot. Okay. So, so I just let I'm you there, there. That's the last one. That's the last one. Okay, right, brilliant. It's, Thank it's the last you. one. So the, there's loads of help and advice out there. Take a screenshot of this um, 
and there's professional development sessions running every day online where you can find out more about this wonderful tool. I can't do it justice in five minutes. Dive in, look at it for yourself, a free amazing resource for teachers and if you do need any more help then please get in touch with me and I'll be more than happy to help you and your peoples at this time. Thank you, Paul. Please pop your Twitter handle into the question window for us. OK, so we're going to move over to Sarah Clark. Uh, Sarah is a biology and science teacher from Queen Anne High School in Dunfermline in Fife in Scotland. She's been a teacher for 20 years and a Microsoft expert for five years. So we're going to hear from Sarah around using Microsoft Teams. Swapping across to Sarah. Oh, no. um, well, as you said, my name is Sarah Clark and I'm a biology and science teacher up at Queen Anne High School in uh, Fife. And I just wanted to share how I'm using Microsoft Teams um, in my class when it comes to remote learning specifically. And I've, I know I've time-wise going through it really quick, so I apologise if I'm, if I'm moving through a little bit too quick there for you. But happy to connect with MD on Twitter afterwards. If you have any questions at all, you can catch me there. Um, just taking through, for those people that, that aren't familiar with it, in terms of what I think of it as, I'm, I think Teams is, is a one-stop shop. Um, basically, where students, staff can communicate, they can collaborate, they can work together on things, whether that is in the classroom or outside of the classroom. Um, I use it to post my work for my pupils, to share all our files. We link up to other apps as well, like Kahoot and Quizlet um, and Flipgrid. And it integrates with the OneNote class notebook if you're using that very, very well. It's essentially our, our digital jota. And what we're also look, looking at is how we can monitor student engagement within our team. So uh, I'll show you one of the tools that you can add on to that that allows you to look at student engagement. And as well, we've been talking about asynchronous and synchronous learning, and we have a mixture of both. So we have some live lessons going on for or check-ins with our students so that we can see how they're doing, uh, as well as a lot of pre-recorded lessons that we put up in Teams also. So this is an example of my team. There's quite a lot of arrows there. Um, just to take you through some of the tabs at the top, we've got our posts, which is where I post the work through. And you can see down the side, we have our channels. We have set our general channel um, in the team to be teachers only, so that all the work gets posted in the general channel and it doesn't get lost in amongst all the, the student chat and the student questions. And the students can then ask for any help or support or any questions they have in a channel underneath to manage it a bit better. This is the file section where we share editable files, non-editable files with the students and our class notebook sits in there. Assignments are linked to our class notebook, although the, you can set assignments as a Word document. Um, we can upload photographs of people work if they don't have access maybe to Word because they're using it on a phone. And our insights there is the tab that shows us um, the data on the students. And Donna was sharing um, PowerPoint. We record a lot of our lessons in PowerPoint, we then export them to a video and actually links in very well with what Paul was saying because we then have them sitting in Flipgrid. So we add a little tab in at the end there that we can add our, our pre-recorded videos through PowerPoint. So when you go into the assignments, you can see here, I can easily see the assignments that have been set for this class. I can see how many pupils have turned them in. Um, and I can see if I go into it a little bit more, I can see that for every individual student and I can get a really, really clear overview of the class. Who's turned in, who's not turned in, who's viewed the assignment but not done it, who was late. Um, so it's given me lots of information as an overview and I can then start reaching out to pupils in the team saying quite a few of you have not done this and I can mention them in the team as well to get them to, to maybe go and look at the assignments if they've missed it first time around. And these are some examples of the work that we get in. The bottom one is an assignment that we've set through OneNote. As we said, this is our digital jotter, so the pupil has typed their biology essay here straight in. Um, and you can see this is the, the bit here, we can see what we've uploaded. I am extremely lucky that I have a, a digital device that has inking on it, so it's a touch screen with a pen. So I can go straight on there. But you, there's other ways you can do it. You can highlight, you can comment, you can type on it. 
Um, if you're using other devices, you can write on the screen as well. So there's lots of ways that you can give your feedback um, into OneNote as well as audio feedback too in OneNote and then return it in Teams. But for our students that maybe don't have a laptop sitting at home, we also set work that is asynchronous. So this task was they were to go and create a foldable based on information. And so that I could check how they were getting on with it, they upload a photo. So they, they have access on their phone, they have the app on their phone, and they take a picture of the work that they've done. You can see there I've circled it, they've uploaded the two files, and I can look at the two files and then underneath, I'm able to give them some feedback on maybe what they need to go back and do or where they need to go next with their task. The insights data. So there's a little plus sign here where you can add different apps to Teams. Some of them are Microsoft apps. Some of them are um, outside of the Microsoft ecosystem, but they will link in with it. And one of them you'll see, which is in preview just now, is called Insights. And when this came in, we are using it as a high skill to engage with it to monitor engagement. How are our pupils accessing it? And you can see in this one, this is the team that has got 100% digital activity on it. So all the pupils that are there are active in this team. And I can see how long it takes them to do assignments and the average time it's taken for feedback to come and grades and so on. But what I can see as well is every day, I can set this so that it gives me how engaged they were on a specific day, that day, seven days, 30 days, and it's showing me where they're working in here, so what days they joined. And it actually became really interesting for us because we noticed a lot of our students are not accessing in the morning. They're in their beds maybe till lunchtime and they're accessing in the afternoon. So if we do have any live meetings and catch up, there's not any point in doing it in the morning because the kids are not engaging at that time. I have another teacher who told me that she was having a look with primary pupils. And when she looked at the insights data that was there, she found out that one of her very young pupils was actually online a lot late at night. And the fact that they were on late at night meant that she phoned home, had a conversation with the parents and just offered up some support. And it just came down to the student not getting their phone um, at night time. So it, it kind of can open up a lot of discussions. I've just emailed three of my pupils in a team to say, I've noticed you've not been on. Is there a problem? Do you need a help with anything? Do you have access on a, on a device? How can I help you? So it just opens up some conversations. So in pulling the three together, Teams was a very good way of, of pulling the three together. We are, as I said, recording our lessons through PowerPoint Recorder, pre-recording them. You can upload them straight into the Files tab in Teams if you have got access in Stream. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, up in Scotland, but you could be uploading them and adding stream to your team. In our case, we add them to Flipgrid and then we share our grid in the team and everything is in one place for the pupils to go. So I hope you've um, found it useful and if you need anything at all, as I said, please get back in contact and I'm happy to share everything that we're doing. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. We literally have two minutes left. We're just about to slip over. So we've got one question, um, which is, can Insight be used to sh show staff engagement too? Not over-analyzing, just useful to know who needs support to access or maybe having difficulties. It depends on the team. If you add it as a staff team, you, can add, you can't add, I, add Insights into a staff team. Donna, am I right? You'll maybe know a little bit more about that than I do. Not as far as I know into a staff team, yeah. but you can get that data from your, your global admin. So your, your admin top, top tier can get that for an overview. So you can see what devices people are using and, and what key times. So if you've set your team as a staff team, you wouldn't be able to get that information through Insights. No. You would have to go to your, your admin yeah. for it. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So just to summarise, we, I've certainly gained an awful lot of knowledge today, new skills, and of course, we've reinforced safeguarding tips throughout each of the presentations. So thank you to all of the panelists for joining this webinar today. We have a series of further webinars which will be coming up. We keep advertising them on the CAS website and on Twitter. Please do engage with Computing at School and Microsoft on Twitter. And also there are the Computing at School web pages and the Computing at School discussion forum. So choose whichever way you'd like to interact and, and take that forward, please. So once again, thank you very much. Um, I'll be ending the webinar in a minute and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Bye.